The potential is there. Instead of being grateful and seeing it as Krishna's arrangement, Indra killed him. <laughs> and then he had to do all kinds of atonements because Vishwa was a Brahmin, he was his guru, <laughs> he was a great soul. He helped him, he saved him. The father of Vishwarup Twashta was furious. He performed a yagya to create a demon who would be the enemy of Indra. But he chanted the mantra with a slight different pronunciation and instead of saying the enemy of Indra, the word meant of whom Indra was the enemy. Now that may not make so much difference to all of you, but made a lot of difference to Twashta. That means instead of the person who would kill Indra, it would mean the person who would be killed by Indra. So out from this fire came Vitrasura. Vitrasura, in his previous life, was the great, humble devotee, Maharaj Chitraketu. Instead of his beautiful spiritual form as Chitraketu, he now had the ugliest possible body. <laughs> he was huge. He just caused fear to everyone. Now Chitraketu was only longing to be in the association of devotees. But he understood everything is the will of the Lord. Poor Vritrasura, just imagine. Poor Chitraketu Maharaj. He's born as an enemy of the devotees. And his only associates are demons. And he's fighting for the demons. His duty is to kill the devotees. <laughs> and he's hated by the devotees. But he has to do it because it's the will of the Lord. Totally misunderstood by everyone. All the sages, all the rishis, all the Vaishnavas, all the, all the demigods who are Vaishnavas, they hate him. He's their worst enemy. They're all praying for him to be dead. And the demons, who are just lusty, proud, envious rascals, they don't love him. They just want to exploit him for their own purposes. Now, all of you are devotees. How would you like to be in that type of association? Where every devotee hates you and wants you to die. And the worst, most sinful demons are simply praising you to exploit you. Totally misunderstood. No one understood him. And he didn't have a mother. <laughs> Usually, no matter how bad you are, your mother understands you. And even if you're really bad, your mother misunderstands you in such a way to think you're nice. Yes? Hiranyakashipu, Hiranyaksha, they had Diti. Even though all the devotees and all the demigods hated him, at least they had a mother saying, oh, you're so nice. They don't understand you. I know who you are. Yes? He didn't even have that. Ravana. What was it? Keshini and Vishrava. He had a father and... Ravana had a mother and father who, who just thought he was just misunderstood. <laughs> Blinded by parental affection. But Vitre... Vitrasura had no mother. Oh, little Vritri, they just don't understand you. I know who you are. <laughs> wasn't like, nothing. Everybody good hated him. And everyone bad was just wanted to use him, exploit him. 
miserable situation, totally misunderstood. He accepted it because it was the will of the Lord. Many examples of this. Here, his dharma is to fight and kill the devotees. And he loves them all. <laughs> he, he has to do it. Something like Bhishma. Bhishma loves the Pandavas more than anyone else on earth after Krishna. But he's obliged to fight against them. It was the will of Krishna to teach the world that even the greatest conqueror like Bhishma will be destroyed and defeated if he has the wrong association and takes side with that bad people. Bhishma attained the ultimate perfection of life because he surrendered to the will of Krishna. But how he was misunderstood. Fighting against the great souls. Protecting the envious. Bhishma is a Mahajan. Mahajano yena katasapanta. Vritrasura was following in the footsteps of the great Mahajan Bhishma in this regard. And he went into the battlefield, and all the Asuras were with him. They attacked. And the amazing thing is, the demon struck first. They were shooting arrows and thunderbolts, and they were, by their mystic powers, they were showering the, 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 the demigods with mountains and trees and rocks and and astras and pramastras and all kinds of things and somehow or other by the power of Indra fought against them. Now actually, before the fight, just by seeing Vritrasura, the demigods realized they were defeated. So they approached Vishnu. What are we going to do now? This Vritrasura single-handedly can destroy all of us. And the Lord told them they should approach Dadichi. And through the bones of his body, they should create a thunderbolt. And that thunderbolt will defeat Vritrasura. So the demigods go to Datichi. And they asked him, we want you to die <laughs> so that we can take your bones and make them into a thunderbolt so that we can regain our heavenly kingdoms and, and enjoy. Essentially, that's what they were asking. Datichi jokingly said, you are asking me something very difficult. People are willing to do anything to maintain their life because without this body, you can't enjoy anything. People will beg, borrow, steal, sin, anything to protect this body. Body is so dear. It's our identity in this world. How can you expect me to just give up this body? He wanted to hear religious principles from the Devatas. And the devotees preached to him. Actually, a great soul, for the benefit of others, is willing to even give up his life. Arivo. Practice what you preach, O devotees. <laughs> for your sense gratification, you want this great Brahmin to die. And you're telling him that great souls should be willing to die for others. But we want you to die for us. So therefore you should die for us. Because great souls die for others. Arivo. 
quite hypocritical. But they were attached. Didici was detached. He said, oh, thank you, you enlightened me so nicely, now I will die. And he just went into meditation and merged his, his body into the five elements and merged his mind in remembering the Supreme Personality of Godhead and attained perfection. The demigods brought Vishwakarma and with his help they took all the bones of Dadichi and created a very, very um, formidable thunderbolt for Indra to fight Vritrasura. So Vritrasura led them on their tack. And the demons just showered the demigods with all kinds of weapons and the, dem and the weapons with, along with Indra, uh, the demigods just annihilated all their weapons. And the, dem the demons were so afraid. The demigods didn't even do anything to them. They just humbled them that all their weapons were powerless. So all the demons turned their backs and ran away. Hare Krishna. Pratrasura was looking at them. He chastised them. Why are you running away? Come back and fight. Why are you such cowards? Do you not know in the Shastras there's two auspicious ways to die? Everyone has to die. There is no exception in this world. The soul is eternal. The body is temporary. Death is inevitable. But there are two auspicious ways to die. One is through the mystic yogic process as a Vaishnava to fix your consciousness on Krishna at the time of death. Then you go back home, back to Godhead. And the other auspicious way to die is if you're a Kshatriya, to die on the battlefield. If you win the battle, you get great opulences. If you die, you go to the heavenly planets and enjoy. So what is the harm? Come back and fight! But the demons were so frustrated because none of their weapons had any effect. They just kept running. And the demigods saw this and started running, at, running from behind them, just attacking them from behind. And Vritrasura chastised the demigods. So what? Why are you attacking them from behind? That means you're cowards. <clears throat> According to the laws of Kshatriya code, if one is a coward and running away, you never fight with them. You're shooting your weapons at the back of these cowardly demons. That means you're as cowardly as them. I'm standing right here before you, all alone, ready to fight you all single-handedly. If you have any real bravery or heroism, don't, don't run after people fleeing away. Fight me. The entire army of demigods were assembled, and Vritrasura was ready to fight them single-handedly. He picked up his trident, it was a huge trident, and just attacked. And with his feet, he was crushing the demigods. When Indra saw his army being trampled to death by the feet of Vritrasura, can you, poor Vritrasura, He's crushing devotees with his feet. <laughs> but it was the will of the Lord. And just stood before him, challenged. He threw a club, powerful, formidable club, toward Vitrasura, who effortlessly caught it with his left hand and then took Indra's club and poof, 
smashed Airavata, Indra's elephant carrier, in the forehead. Airavata fell back 14 yards, vomited blood, and fell to the ground. Indra on top of him. Indra became really, really discouraged. <laughs> very, very discouraged. <laughs> what am I going to do now? This man is so powerful. Vritrasura. As a Kshatriya, you have to speak weapons as well as throw weapons. He blasted against Indra. But actually, he was preaching to him with pure love and compassion. In the mood of a Kshatriya, he said, Indra, you coward, you despicable fallen rascal. You killed Vishwarup. You killed a Brahmin. You killed your spiritual master. You killed my brother. Why? Because you're so despicably attached to your heavenly pleasures. That's all. Therefore, you deserve to die from the pointed spear of my trident. Hare Krishna. And when you die, Indra, you are so sinful, even fire will not touch you to purify your body. You will simply be eaten by beastly, despicable vultures. The fight went. But then Indra was so discouraged. He just gave up. There's nothing I could do against this Vitrasura. He lost all faith in himself. It was in this setting that the verses we're reading today were spoken. Should I read you the verses? He who has killed a Brahmin, he who has killed a spiritual master, indeed he who has killed my brother is now by good fortune standing before me face to face as my enemy. O oh, most abominable when, when I pierce your stone-like heart with my trident, I shall be freed from my debt to my brother. Only for the sake of living in the heavenly planets, you killed my other brother, a self-realized, sinful, qualified Brahmin who had appointed your chief priest. He was your spiritual master, but although you entrusted him with the performance of your sacrifice, you later mercilessly severed his heads from his body the way one butchers an animal. Indra, you are bereft of all shame, mercy, glory, and good fortune. Deprived of these good qualities by the reactions of your fruit of activities, you are to be condemned even by the man-eaters, rakshashas. Now I shall pierce your body with my trident, and after you die with great pain, even fire will not touch you. Only the vultures will eat your body. Do you like this? Please listen carefully. You are naturally cruel. If the other demigods, unaware of my prowess, follow you by attacking me with raised weapons, I shall sever their heads with my sharp trident. 
With those heads, I shall perform a sacrifice to Bhairava and the other leaders of the ghosts along with their hordes. But if in this battle you cut off my head with your thunderbolt and kill my soldiers, O Indra, O great hero, This is so beautiful. The verses we just read is chastising Indra out of loving compassion to try to get him out of his maya, to try to cut through his false ego, to try to humble him from his egoistic position, to get him to actually repent for his material attachments and how they drove him to such abominable activities. But now, from this verse on, Vitrasura is calling him a great hero and telling what will happen if he kills, if he kills him. And what a benediction it will be to Vitrasura. But if in this battle you cut off my head with your thunderbolt and kill my soldiers, O Indra, O great hero, I shall take great pleasure in offering my body to other living entities such as jackals and vultures. I shall thus be relieved of my obligations to the reactions of my karma and my fortune will be to receive the dust from the lotus feet of great devotees like Narada Muni. Vitrasura is here. If you kill me, my body is abominable. I'm a demon. <laughs> I don't care what happens to this body. You are so attached to your body. You offend your own guru. You kill your own guru. Nice Brahmin like Dadichi. You, have to, you make him die just for your body. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I will take great pleasure in this wretched body of mine being eaten by vultures and jackals. But in my mind, in my heart, I will find complete shelter in the dust of the lotus feet of great devotees like Narada Muni. O king of the demigods, since I, your enemy, am standing before you, why don't you hurl your thunderbolt at me? Although your attack upon me with your club was certainly useless, like a request of money from a miser, the thunderbolt you carry will not be useless. You need have no doubts about this. He's telling Indra, you should not be so attached to your activities. <laughs> Success, failure, honor, dishonor, these dualities. Victory, defeat, loss and gain. Basic teaching of Gita. We should just perform our duties for the sake of Dharma, for the sake of Krishna's pleasure, and not be attached to the results. Why are you discouraged, Indra? You're just standing there as if you're defeated. You're not even willing to fight anymore because your club didn't work. You've given up your fight. Because of some setback. Don't worry. Keep fighting. This is a message to all of us. Srila Prabhupada explains that when we become devotees, we're declaring war against Maya. And in this war against Maya, there's the war and there's many battles. There's battles that happen every day, so many times. But the main war... That is what is of a great concern. Sometimes in our devotional service we may fail. Sometimes we may even be weak. Srila Prabhupada pleads with us, do not give up the fight. Even if you lose a battle, even if you lose a few battles, don't give up. Keep fighting against Maya. If we have good association of devotees, that association will empower us 
to carry on with the fight. If we take shelter of our sadhana and take shelter of the Vaishnavas, no matter how many setbacks may be there on the spiritual path, we can come back and ultimately, by the grace of the Lord, be victorious. We have seen devotees even fall down from the principles of Krishna consciousness, even fall very deeply into materialistic life and immoral activities due to some offenses or some inattentiveness in their sadhana. But if they once again come in the association of devotees and get that encouragement, they can be empowered to make great comebacks. And in this life, go back home, back to Godhead. So a devotee should always be very, very strict not to fall victim to Maya. But even if there's a setback, we should never give up the association of Vaishnavas and never give up fighting the battle, the war. This is what Vritrasura is telling Indra and telling all of us. Krishna will help us if we just keep fighting. Never give up. No matter what, never give up. You dare to instruct and criticize Shiva? Huh? Do you know who's watching this scene right now? Not only all these great rishis and yogis who have renounced the world. Why didn't they say anything? Because they know that Shiva is spotless. Lord Brahma, he's watching. Why doesn't he come down and say something? Because he knows he's spotless. All the greatest of the demigods, they are watching. Why don't they say anything? Chitra Ketu? You think that you know more, that you are greater, than you are in a superior position, than all these great sages, than all the demigods, than Lord Brahma himself? I curse you. Become a demon in the family of demons. But actually, she addressed him as her son. <laughs> At that very last verse, she said, because you have offended, my dear son, she said, my dear son, you take birth in the line of demons. <coughs> Parvati was being merciful. Because she is the mother of every living creature within this material existence. <coughs> During our Mayapur Yatra, we went to Simantadweep. Do you remember? There, Shiva was dancing in ecstasy, chanting the names of Goranga. And Parvati never saw her husband in such a state. She said, who is this Goranga? <laughs> Tell me, why are you so happy? And he said that my, the Supreme Lord Krishna appears with the sentiments of Radharani in the form of Goranga. And he gives love of God freely in this beautiful golden complexion. So she started, she went to Simantadweep and she just constantly was chanting the names of Goranga and Lord Chaitanya appeared to her. And she prayed. Why am I so unfortunate? All your devotees, they are just trying to help everyone get released from material existence by preaching Krishna consciousness. And they're always with you, hearing and chanting about your pastimes and helping others. And my service is to keep everyone bound to this material existence, to create illusions and attachments in people's minds to keep them away from you. There's no one more unfortunate than me. 
And Lord Chaitanya said that you are my beloved Radharani Parvati in the form of her external energy. Srimati Radharani is making every arrangements for all the devotees to love me in the spiritual world. And in this world, you, my own pleasure potency, take your form to test people and to ultimately purify the conditioned souls so that they will come back to my loving service. So Parvati is the consort of the Lord who is the mother of all living beings within this creation, within the whole cosmic manifestation. So she was talking to Chitraketu like a naughty child. And as a mother, she gave him the proper punishment. Now, what was the punishment for? Why? This, dear audience, is most important to understand very deeply and carefully. Are you awake? If you're not, now you are. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is quoted by Srila Prabhupada. Chitraketu, after giving up all hope of any happiness in material existence by suffering more miserably than anyone could possibly suffer and wholeheartedly taking shelter of the association of the great Vaishnavas, following their instructions with their hearts and souls, he was given personal association of the Lord. He saw the Lord. The Lord blessed him. The Lord spoke to him. But what happened? He became a little proud. Hare Krishna. Chichiketu became proud. I saw Lord Vishnu. I'm so pure. I'm so... The Lord is so merciful to me. I saw Vishnu. And because of the pride, the little bit of pride that developed in his heart from getting such personal association with the Lord, he thought that he was in a position to instruct Lord Shiva. Even though he was doing it as a well-wisher, that was an offense. And here in Srila Prabhupada cites, Trinarapi sunichena taror iba sihishnuna Amanina manadena kirtaniya sada hari. We should be more humble than the straw in the street, tolerant like tree, ready to offer all respect to others and expect none in return. If we're not trying to seriously cultivate this consciousness, we will offend others. As soon as there's pride, an offensive mentality is inherent within us. And if we start offending others, if we start criticizing others, it's very likely that we will offend a Vaishnav. And if we offend a Vaishnav, we have to pay serious consequences. We see this in Chitraketu Maharaj. We see this throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and in the Bhakti Shastras. Again and again and again, there are examples of even powerful, great personalities who offend Vaishnavas. And what happens to them? Here is Chitraketu. What is our position compared to him? He was just in the spiritual world seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> and the Lord is, is, is bestowing mercy on him, love and affection. 
and he's offering beautiful prayers that are in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we cite those prayers that he offered to the Lord. But he became proud. Very dangerous. Within our contemporary life, there were direct associates of Lord Chaitanya who became proud and criticized Vaishnavas and fell down. Ramchandra Puri was a personal associate of Madhavendra Puri. He was an associate of Ishwara Puri. God brothers, what association? But still, there was some pride in his heart. And he thought he could instruct a superior person. And he lost all his good qualities. Fell down. And here we have Chitraketu. He's in the spirit. He's seeing Vishnu. Yes, you may be a Prabhupada disciple. You may be a personal servant of Prabhupada. You may, may, be, you may have been part of his personal intimate entourage. You may have been one of the first devotees to help him. But if it makes us proud, it makes us feel that we're better than someone else. Even a second generation devotee or a third generation devotee who's a Vaishnav, who never met Prabhupada, who's even touching our feet and begging us, please give me nectar. If we offend that person, if we unnecessarily criticize such a person because of our high connection, reaction will come. We could lose our taste for Krishna consciousness. We could fall down. It's very serious. We could be a pujari. Personally, for years and years and years, doing all the offerings to Krishna. But if we become proud and think we're better than others, and criticize a Vaishnav, we could fall down. We could be personal associates with a lot of, with, with, with great, great association of great souls, spiritual master, powerful yogis, Vaishnavas. But if we're proud that I'm more fortunate than you, and criticize another, could lose everything. This is how powerful Maya is. Here is Chitraketu. After all he went through, <laughs> and after surrendering to his guru, he became a little proud. And what was his offense? Because he was proud, he thought that he could criticize Lord Shiva and he did it for a very constructive good purpose, but still he criticized. And Parvati, who was the mother, his mother, had to teach him a good lesson. And through him had to teach all of us a good lesson. In this regard, Srila Prabhupada writes, therefore, whatever our position, however high or low we may be, whoever we may have associated with in our lives, you have to remain he's meek and humble and go on with your devotional service and not criticize others. The guru can make offense to disciples if criticizing without proper motivation. Although it is the duty of guru to sometimes criticize, it is sometimes the duty of a superior to criticize. 
But if it's not done very carefully, very constructively, there could be massive reactions. We read about it. And we see it. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu raised both of his arms and he cried out, chant the holy names and do not criticize others. If Chitraketu, who just saw Vishnu, is not exempt to this rule, don't think that you or me will be. It's very clear. The mind affected by Maya will always justify why I have the right. But be careful. Yes. You have the right to fall down. That's the problem. You have the right to criticize, but you also have the right to fall down, even from such an elevated position. Don't think a big post, don't think being honored and worshipped gives you the right to criticize others. But in Kali Yuga, you're just a sentimental fool if you don't. That's the way the world will label you. Yes? When the internet is full of so much criticisms and condemnations, the Bhagavatam explains, in this story actually, that Ordinary people who may even be in the guise of devotees, due to whatever reason, will always be there to blaspheme and criticize great devotees. It's always been, it will always be. We should never be surprised with this. In this regard, Srila Prabhupada tells us a Bengali saying. Do you like Bengali sayings? When Prabhupada speaks them, they are very relishable. There is a Bengali saying that if the vulture curses the cow, the cow is not disturbed. The nature of a vulture, being the lowest of animals, is to curse the cow. But that curse cannot take effect on the cow, because a cow is a holy animal. So similarly, the blasphemes and the criticisms of envious people, or ordinary people, or materialistic people, even in the guise of devotees, against Sincere Vaishnavas should never be taken seriously. And the great Vaishnavas also, the cow doesn't care for the curse of the vulture. As long as we know we're sincerely trying to serve Krishna, then what should we care what people say? But we should be very, very careful that we don't become vulture. We can be vultures with neck beads and tilak <laughs> and dhotis and saris. And we can even have high positions. But we should not criticize devotees. Prabhupada warns us so seriously in this story that we should just go on performing our sadhana, engaged in our devotional service, and be careful not to find faults with Vaishnavas. To encourage devotees, to see the glories in devotees. 
And Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, there was that one devotee who came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Kuliagram and told him, with this mouth I have blasphemed your devotees. What should I do? Lord Chaitanya said, blasphemy of devotees, criticizing of devotees is like drinking poison. The only antidote is nectar. Glorifying devotees is nectar. With the same mouth that drank the poison of blasphemy, praise those devotees, drink nectar, and you will go back home, back to Godhead. But it's very difficult. Because when so many people are talking criticisms, and then they're, just anybody can put their criticisms on the international venue of the internet. And anybody could say anything about anyone. It becomes fashionable. We have seen. People are very proud and fashionable about criticizing others. It makes them seem very important. It makes them really feel like they're in the groove. And if you don't want to hear it, and you don't want to speak it, huh, what's sem sentimental, just sentimentalism, fool. You will be labeled as a sentimental fool if you don't criticize and blaspheme Vaishnavas. By other Vaishnavas. That's the condition in this age of Kali. But who should we take seriously? Those people who are putting the stake of, of, of stake of spiritual death in their own hearts by doing it? Or the words of Srila Prabhupada, the words of Srimad Bhagavatam, the words of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of his associates and the entire parampara, they are all calling out very, very loudly, do not criticize others. Encourage Vaishnavas. Follow proper etiquette. Chant the glories of the Lord, chant the glories of the devotees, Trinada pisuni chena, taror ibasihishuna. Amanina, manadena, kirtaniya sadahari. This verse is not a detail. Why is it quoted so much? It's a matter of spiritual life and death. To learn to offer honor to others and not expect it or demand it ourselves. Yes, Parvati saw that some pride was in the heart of Chitraketu because he became a personal associate of the Lord. And she had to root that pride out of his heart. So she cursed him to fall down. Hare Krishna. And be a demon. Now, Chitra Ketu Maharaj, he understood his mistake. And he was such an advanced devotee. Even though he made that mistake, he was such an advanced devotee. He showed us how, even if we do something wrong, how to react. He just saw Vishnu. He was a great king. He had the power to curse Parvati. Can you imagine? That's how powerful he was, the Bhagavatam says. Who amongst us has the power to curse the goddess who is the superintendent of the entire cosmic manifestation? He had that power to curse her and it would take effect. But he was not angry. He was not disappointed. He was grateful. 
This was the greatness of Chitraketu. When he was cursed and criticized severely as being the lowest rascal in front of everybody, not only in front of everybody, but it was going to be in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam forever. When Goddess Parvati labels you as being a rascal and nonsense, <laughs> would you like that? He bowed down to Parvati with a grateful heart and thanked her for her mercy. Yes, Parvati. I accept whatever you're saying. Actually, please know I was not criticizing your husband. It may have sounded like that. I acted improperly. I shouldn't have instructed him. But I was only doing it because I adore him. I worship him. I love him. I was just trying to serve him. But I served him in the wrong way. That was his understanding. He explained himself, but he accepted. If this is what I must go through, I'm not the controller. You're not the controller. Krishna's the controller. And Krishna knows what's best for each devotee. Tatenu kampam susamikshamano bunjana evatmakritam vipaga. Srila Prabhupada quotes in this regard Who is qualified to go back to Godhead? That person who is in the most difficult, miserable, traumatic situation and with folded palms thanks the Lord with grateful heart and bows down. Chichiketu Maharaj exemplified this principle. He thanked Parvati with all respect. Dear Mother, yes, whatever you've done is good. Now with your permission, I will go to hell and be a demon. Shiva, Parvati, and all the great sages were so deeply impressed with Chitraketu Maharaj. Parvati was in ecstasy. How he passed this test. What a great saint. And Shiva just looked at her, smiled, and said, See, what is a Vaishnav? No one could be like a Vaishnav. Narayana parasarave nakutashtana bibyate swaraka pavaraka apitulyate darshanam. Those who worship Lord Narayan with love, whether they're in hell, whether they're in heaven, whether they're liberated, it doesn't make any difference. They only want to serve. They're happy just serving in any situation. Whether they're blaspheme miserably, whether they're cast into hell, or whether they're exalted to the spiritual world or the heavenly planets, it makes no difference. They're simply happy serving Krishna because that's what makes Krishna happy. That is a Vaishnav. Shiva was praising Chitraketu. Parvati was praising Chitraketu. All the sages were praising Chitraketu for being so glorious. And it was at this point that he really attained the highest perfection. When he was tested to such a degree of being cursed to be a demon and he was grateful. That was the culmination of his spiritual sanctity. But then he became a demon. It's not so easy to go back to Godhead. <laughs> but we can learn through him and go back to Godhead in this very life. Should I continue? What time is lunch, Prasad? Does anyone know?
Well, until I get the message, I will continue. Meanwhile, back in Swargaloka, King Indra is sitting on his throne. He's being worshipped by all sages, rishis, demigods, with Sachi, his consort, on his side, on a beautiful throne. And while he's being worshipped, his guru, Brihaspati, comes into the room. Indra didn't criticize him. He saw him, but he didn't do anything. After all, he's sitting on a throne and everyone's chanting Indra's glories. In the Samaveda, Rig Veda, there's so many beautiful hymns praising Lord Indra. They're chanting these hymns and chamaras and gifts. And he's just performing his duty by accepting all this puja. That's the duty of Indra, to accept all this puja. So he just went on accepting. Brihaspati came in and left. Why did he leave? Because he knew Indra's going to fall down. (laughs) Why? He made an offense. He did not honor a great Vaishnava.